It is your breath, for sure, Lord. It is your breath in our lungs. And this is how we pour out our praise. Lord, I pray we give you this morning. We thank you for it, God. We thank you for your word. And we pray that this morning would be uh, an act of worship to you, Lord, an act of an act of praise, Lord. May the breath that you've given us in our lungs, may our hearts, may everything be unified with you, and, and, and may it all glorify you, Lord. Be with us. I pray that your spirit would hover over our thoughts and our words and our hearts. God, open up your word to us uh, as only you can, as only your spirit can. Lord, we pray that you would, you would once again say, let there be light, and may that light shine in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. All right, you may be seated, ladies. Last week, as we dug into Genesis chapter 1, uh, we discussed this big picture view of Scripture a big picture view and how these various themes like fabrics and, and the threads of a quilt are woven and stitched together throughout the Bible and how all of these themes are being introduced in Genesis 1 and I'm going to say Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. Uh, and it, today, I hope you saw this week that more themes were popping up I was going to say out of the ground, but out of the scripture in Genesis 2. Um, I know I said that Genesis chapter 1 was my favorite, but Genesis chapter 2 is my new favorite today, ladies. This has a, a, a most favorite biblical theme of mine, and that is the theme of rest. Uh, eight years ago... Yeah, I'm sure. I, some of you should have said amen to that, all right? <laughs> amen to rest, right? Um, eight years ago, Dave and I and our youngest daughter, over the week of 4th of July, we flew to Shanghai, China for a look-see. And a look-see is that you go and you look at a place and you see, will you commit to moving there? And so we went, we did our look-see, and we committed, and three weeks later, my husband was in Shanghai uh, starting a new job. Two weeks later, Mary and I followed. So ladies, I have, you might remember I have four children, and the other three were going to college that fall. So those five weeks were insane. That was insane. Uh, trying to get the three children packed up and ready for college, us packing up our belongings to move to China, um, I squeezed in a knee surgery that I had been putting off. I know, it was nuts. And a few months prior to that, I um, had lost my mom to cancer. And that was, it was, you ladies, many of you have been through this. It's a hard journey um, to walk with a loved one through that. And so um, I, boy... <laughs> I, 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 I'm so thankful I do not have a picture of myself the night before we are heading to China. Ladies, I, I mean, it's no joke. I literally was on the ground weeping. How can I leave my three children here in the States? I was just exhausted from the preparations. I was exhausted in every way, and yeah, I'm so thankful I don't have a picture, but if I did, here's my picture. I look something like this. This is what I looked like by the time I got to China. Um, I was desperate for rest. I was in every way exhausted, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, that I felt like this. I was desperate for rest. I was wondering where in the heck is home, um, that kind of thing. And God gave me a verse during that time, and it was Psalm 4610. This is a familiar one to a lot of you. Be still and know that I am God. And it was the very first verse that I learned in Mandarin. Um, and and if I translated it from the Mandarin back into the English, it would sound like this. 
you must rest. You must know that I am God. It's that way in the English, too. We just don't see those imperative commands. They don't jump out to us. So, ladies, my time in China, that began a journey for me to understand what is rest. What does it mean to rest? Because I, when, I, when, when, when I learned what that meant in China, you must rest, you must know God, that put me on my knees. I'm like, um, Lord, I don't know. I don't know how to rest. I don't know how to know that you are God. And so I began this journey, and I began on my own to unpack this theme of rest. I began in Genesis right here and went all through Scripture while I was in China. And I kind of I began to write a study on rest while I was there. It's an unfinished work, ladies, one of these days. And then when I got back from China, I went to school, I went to seminary, and almost every time I had an opportunity to write a paper or research something, it pertained to this topic of rest. So I could tell you, we could be here the rest of the day just unpacking this topic of rest. I wish that we could, but we're going to try to get just a, a taste of what is this rest in the Old Testament. What is this rest uh, that God does, and what is the rest that he gives us? If you're feeling like this, and I know all of us have felt like this at times, anxious, afraid, even I, when I'm anxious and I'm afraid, then I'm ashamed that I'm anxious and, and afraid, you know, so there's all these things mixed up in there. If we are feeling that way, then ladies, God invites us into the garden, into the garden where flowers look like this, where flowers look like this. So before we dig in, in order to best understand Genesis chapter 2, we need to understand what's the difference between a house and a home. What's the difference between a house and a home. Now, Dave and I, we've moved a lot. That wasn't our only move. In our first 14 years of marriage, we actually moved seven times. I know. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? I've had kind of, I guess we all can say, we, some, if you ever feel like, yeah, I've had a crazy life, it's been something. Anyway, one thing that I learned from that, ladies, is a house is just a house. It's just a house. It's got a foundation, hopefully, and a roof, and um, walls, plumbing, electricity. A house is just a house. I looked it up in the dictionary, and here's the definition. A house is a building for human habitation. A house is a building. So I'm blessed in that every house that I've ever lived in has had these things, a working toilet, running water, electricity, and a working stove, and somewhat working oven. I'm, I'm blessed. And if we have that, like, we, we are rich compared to most of the world, right? Yes. So that's a, that's a house, a building for human habitation. What makes a house a home? What makes a house a home? Home, here's the definition in just a regular old dictionary. The place in which one's domestic affections are centered. The place in which one's domestic affections are centered. Well, what does that mean? Home is where your heart is. That's a simply, I think that's as simple as we can get. Home is where your heart is. Home is a place where we dwell, where we live, where we care where we cry and we laugh with one another through the sorrows and joys of life. And so I want to just put out before you today that Genesis chapter 1 is a house story. We see God building a house. It's the structure. But Genesis chapter 2, this is the home story. This is the home story. We're going to unpack. Let's dig right in. Genesis 2. I'm just going to read the first three verses here. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. 
So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, there's a, there's a lot of repetition there, isn't there? Yeah, um, we see some themes here, some new themes. We see rest, and it's alongside this theme of work. And if we make some observations, like the, if we start with who, who's in here, this is God who we read about in creation. It, it continues to tell us more about who he is. And I'd like to say these, these three verses really tag along with the first chapter, don't we? And here is, ladies, the climax of the creation. This is the climax. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily uh, the creation of man and woman in the image of God. Here's the climax. Day seven is it. And what do we see? God's work is done. It's done. It's finished. And we might ask the question, well, which work is done? And, I mean, I ask, what's it like to finish a work, you know, to finish a job? It never feels like we get done, does it? But what work is God, what has he finished? And the answer is right here in Scripture for us. In verse 3, it says, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So his creation work is done. And um, it says that his, his work, it says in verse 2, God finished his work that he had, has done. So let's define work and let's define finished. This work here in the Hebrew uh, would be God's mission, his business, his craft or trade. So God has finished his mission of creation. This word finished Maybe I ought to take us to the cross. What did Jesus say when he was on the cross? It is finished. It is finished. And what did that mean? His work on earth his, and his work on the cross, it's, it was accomplished. So God's mission of creation is accomplished. And he rests. And the Hebrew word here for rest is Shabbat. And it means to cease. To cease. So what did God do? He stopped his work of creation. He ceased that work. Now, did some of you ask, wow, God rests? God rests? And, you know, when, with our, um, you know, what does rest look like? If we, we have these, I think, 21st century presuppositions and assumptions of what rest looks like. What's our... What, what does rest look like in your mind, ladies? What does it look like? Loud? <laughs> no, not to do any work. What was it? A couch. A couch. <laughs> All right. Yes. A nap. A hammock. A beach chair, right? A vacation. S give me some sleep, doggone it. Yeah, a bed. So all of these things, this is what we think of when we think of rest, isn't it? Now, does God need that? Does God need a couch? No. We know this in our heads, uh, but we also know it from Scripture. Psalm 121.4, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. Isaiah 40, 28, I love this one. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. God doesn't need rest as we picture rest. So we must need a new definition. We must, we must better understand, okay, what is this rest? We have, to put a, every, we have to put aside everything that we think we know about rest. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. <laughs> um, so what do we do at this time period? We put on our ancient Near East glasses, don't we? And in ancient Near East literature, scholars find that whenever gods are building something, do you know what they're building? They're building their temple. They're building their home. This is in all the other ancient Near East literature 
of this time. When gods are building something, they're building their temple. And so day seven makes sense if we see the first six days as God building this structure, God building his house, God building a temple for himself where man will worship him. The structure, like, and, and he does it so orderly, right? He, he brings, um, he, he not only builds, he brings order to it, and everything is prepared, and everything is, is good, right? We saw the six days. It is good, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is, and it ends with, it is very good. It's all prepared. It's all prepared to function now as God's sanctuary. And so day seven this rest is, is God coming home into his sanctuary. Um, every, every move that Dave and I have done has, has looked similar in this way. It starts with an empty house. It's void. There's nothing there. And we pack up all of our belongings, and we get it in the house, and it's utter chaos. There is um, furniture, boxes, and just stuff everywhere. There's no order. It's just a house. There's, there's um, this stuff, and there's plumbing, and there's electricity, and there's a roof, and walls, and foundation, but it's not functioning as a home. It's not functioning as a home. And so for several days, what do we do? We arrange the furniture. We unpack boxes. We get everything in its place uh, to bring order to this house. Why? Why do we do that? For what purpose? Well, it kind of sounds like a silly question, doesn't it? Uh, we, we expect to live there. We're making it into a home, a place where we will function. We don't do all of that work just so that we can have an extended nap or sleep. And we don't do all of that work uh, with the idea that we're going to leave it either. We do all of this to make the house into a home where we can function and we can live and we can dwell and we can care and we can love one another. This is where we will reside. So on day seven here, what does God do? God rests. The heavens and the earth become his home. Um, this is his sanctuary where he, where he will rule and relate with mankind. Isaiah 66, 1 says this, Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. And so doesn't it make sense, ladies, that day seven would be set apart in some way? Day seven would be commemorated, be like a coronation ceremony. And so what do we see that God does? He makes it holy. He does set it apart. He uh, consecrates it. He dedicates it. Did anyone ask, well, what did God do on the eighth day? What did God do on the eighth day? There is no, I mean, you might have noticed here on day seven, there is no, and there was uh, evening and there was morning the seventh day. God's rest is not something that he does only on the seventh day. This is what he does every day thereafter. In John 5, the Jews ask Jesus, the Pharisees are upset. Why? Because the, the, um, Jesus has been healing people on the Sabbath, and they're upset. And they, they ask him, well, why are you doing these things on the Sabbath? And Jesus answers by saying, my father is working until now, and I am working. So God rests from his creation work that he had done. The heavens and the earth become his sanctuary, become his temple. It's his home. It's his place of, of residence, his place of relationship. It's a place of his rule. And he shares this with mankind. He shares this with man. Ladies, this is not just a house story. This is a home story. And it is a home story for God, and it's a home story for man as well. Um, if we, again, if we put on our ancient Near East glasses, it's kind of interesting. In all the other ancient Near East uh, literature, <clears throat> talking about gods and man, always 
Men are the God's servants. They're minions to do all the work that the gods do not want to do and any work that the gods are tired of do. Uh, they, they use the men as slave, slave labor. Truly, there's no, there, there's no care for uh, mankind. And so an example would be that man provides the food and the clothing and really just provides everything for the gods. But what do we see in Genesis chapter 2? What have we seen in Genesis chapter 1 and 2? This is radically different. This is, I mean, in, in the ancient Near East world, life in the garden is radical because who's providing for who? God is providing for man. So I, I want to uh, kind of run through some of, I, we don't have time to unpack everything. You'll unpack it a little bit more around the tables, but I'd like to look at life in the garden. What is life like in the garden? What do we observe? What do we notice here? The author does an amazing job of describing the richness of the garden. And I think there's more biblical themes kind of popping out all over the place in, in this chapter. Ladies, I'm going to go uh, directly to verse 7. This is, a, this is a key verse. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So let's just start right there. Here we see something new. It's not just God. It's not just Elohim. It's Lord God, isn't it? I'm sure that intrigued a few of you, and you already know, okay, this is, this is Yahweh God, and Yahweh is a name for God that the Israelites use. They, they, they had um, such a holy fear of God and of, of, of him. They knew this was their own personal God, and so Yahweh is a personal name that they wouldn't even speak out loud. It's too holy for them to even say. So this is a special uh, personal name, and to put these two together is very unique. So it shows this personal dynamic between God and the man that he creates here out of the dust. Ladies, if we went out here and tried to create something out of the dust, out of the soil, what, what do you think we could make? <laughs> you know, let's not lose sight of the mir how, how miraculous this is. God forms a man, and they think of all the different body parts, the brain, the heart, the lungs, the arteries, like everything he forms out of dust, out of dust. Pastor Mike is right, we're dirt bags. Uh, he does this, forms man out of the dust, and then he imparts to him the breath of life, his very own breath, such that man is created in the image of God. And this breath of life, it's only used for either the spirit of God or this breath that is imparted to man. It's never used for animals, ladies. Um, this is often translated as a living soul. So verse 7, that's a key verse. And, and then what do we see in verse 8? Um, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So who's doing what? Is man creating a garden for the Lord? God is creating the garden and puts man there. And what's in this garden? We see in verse 9, there's every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And uh, we, he, God's just having the trees spring up. And we see, you know, two particular trees are mentioned. In verse 10, we see the rivers, right? The, the rivers. It says, a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. What's it saying? The rivers of the world come from God's garden. 
The rivers of the world come from God's garden. And, and the river symbolizes what? It symbolizes fertility. It symbolizes life. It symbolizes blessing. And all these rivers flow out of God's garden. It's as if flowing out from God's temple, which is a theme that we see consistently throughout Scripture. Um, I love this one from Ezekiel 47.1. Uh, Ezekiel says, the man brought me back to the entrance to the temple, and I saw the water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. Did you notice? Eden in the east. There's a connection here. Water and the temple. Revelation 22, verse 1, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal. Look at where it's flowing, ladies. Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Isn't that beautiful? Another theme, it's another fabric in the quilt of Scripture that runs throughout Scripture. If we took a look at the tabernacle and the temple, we would see ideas of water. We'll come back to that a little bit at the end. What else do we see in this garden? We see um, how rich it is. There's precious gems. There's gold in this garden. This is a rich land. And that's another theme that we see run throughout Scripture. The idea of, um, of, of the garden being rich. <laughs> Again, Ezekiel 28, 13. There's a lot hidden away in Ezekiel. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, he talks about the garden of God. He talks about Eden. And he says, every precious stone was there. Sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald. Um, and, and there was gold there. All of that was prepared in creation. And then, of course, we might think about Revelation 2, right? And the new Jerusalem and, and the richness of, of paradise there. The new Jerusalem, the walls built of jasper, the city of gold. And again, it lists all kinds of, of precious gemstones, uh, jasper, sapphire, agate, emerald, onyx, many, many. I can't, I can't fathom what that what that kind of richness looks like. Can you? Dave and I had the opportunity to, I think I've already mentioned this, we went to England to visit our youngest daughter and her husband who were living there. We were there in August. And while we were there, we went to the Tower of London and we got to see the crown jewels. And ever since I've been watching The Crown on Netflix. Um, but these crown jewels, I'm not a big jewelry person, and my husband definitely is not. But it's one of the favorite things that we did, one of the favorite things that we saw while we were there. And you, there, it's all in these heavy-duty, bulletproof glass cases. And there's like this little escalator thing that you stand on, and it you kind of go, go by, and you can go on the front side of the crown jewels and on the back side, and it wasn't busy. It was raining that day, so we just kept hopping on and going back and <laughs> looking at them again. Ladies, I saw a 530-carat diamond. I know. It's on the end of a scepter, and that's been used for hundreds of years, and Queen Elizabeth used it for her coronation. We might get to see whoever is crowned as king next use that scepter. I'd look on the end. There's this 530 carat diamond, ladies. Even I, I, the jewels were unbelievable. The the emeralds, the rubies, the sapphires. I don't even know what they all were. Just big jewels of all kinds. It's got nothing. It's got nothing on the garden here. This is a rich land. It's beautiful. What else do we see in the garden? We see God sharing his work with man. Um, what does God do? God, God, God brings all the animals to Adam. Adam gets to share, or the, the man, he's not named just yet. Uh, the man gets to name the animals. That's sharing in God's rule, in God's, uh, in, in God's dominion, right? And we know that. We saw that in the last chapter. 
and let, and let us create man in our own image and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and over all the livestock and over all the earth and over everything that creeps on the earth. And so one, one I mean, this is, a, this is a big job. This was a job of gods in the ancient Near East were to name things. That's part of creating something. We see woman is created here in the garden. I'd love to unpack more of this story, but isn't that, it's, there's something special that woman is created here from the side of Adam, but she's created in the garden as a helper. And ladies, I, I'm just going to just say two, I don't know, just a little teeny tiny bit about that because I think we might talk about this more next week. This idea of being a helper fit for Adam, I think we have such a low view of what that is today. Um, it's not the, like, we get stuck in our 21st century assumptions and presuppositions and the culture that we've grown up in and the church culture that we've grown up in. This is not just a 1950s housewife of making the home a haven for the man. You know what I'm saying? It's, there's a place for that. Don't get me wrong. There's a place for us helping to make our homes a haven for our families. But this is a higher calling. The only other time we see the word helper being used, it's God being the helper for man. It's God is the helper. You see that all through Scripture, all through the Old Testament. Psalm 46, 1, the um, God is the helper. God is the helper. So there's a very, very high calling. Don't think about this so much as the physical aspect. Think about what does it mean to be a helper in the spiritual realm? How do I pray for my husband? How do I help him spiritually have um, take part in God's kingdom building? It's such a high calling. Okay, that wasn't too bad of a... <laughs> what else do we see? A couple more things I want to point out. We see oneness and unity. Has anybody ever seen that? Oneness and unity in a marriage relationship 24-7? In any relationship 24-7, there is oneness and unity. How do we wrap, I mean, how do we wrap our minds around that? How do we wrap our minds around nakedness and no shame? Nakedness and no shame. There's a physical aspect to being naked and having no shame. I don't know what that looks like, ladies. But there's a there's a, there's a huge spiritual implication of being naked, having somebody know your thoughts. Like there's no sin here, no sin. So when God says this is very good, what is it? It is very good. Like I, I don't have words for it. We just have to take that. It is very good in the garden. This is paradise. This is paradise. And, and it's real. Like, this, this isn't made up. This is a real place. We saw, we saw this as when Jesus was on the cross. What did he say to the criminal hanging next to him? He says, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise. Life in the garden, ladies, it's beautiful here. It's lush. There's life. Um, I think it's fragrant. We don't know exactly what this bedillium is. It could be a stone, but there's also a bush that has an incredible fragrance to it. So it's, there's beauty. There's life. There's a fragrance. I mean, it's, it's paradise. Who wants to move? Who wants to move into the garden? Adam didn't have to move himself. And here's one of my favorite verses. Uh, 
<laughs> I wonder how many times I say that too. Verse 215, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Let's unpack that just a little bit. He took the man. So did Adam have to do anything? No, the Lord takes him. And Paul uses a similar phrase. We studied it last year in Philippians when when Paul says, look, not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for what? For which Christ has taken hold of me. And when we, we know that when we look at Paul, who took hold of Paul when Paul was on the road to Damascus? Jesus took hold of him. He shined the light. So God takes hold of Adam puts Adam in the garden. And this is a different put. Uh, if we could read Hebrew, this is a different put than we saw earlier in verse 8 when God planted the garden and put Adam there. This put has, it's used very infrequently in scripture. And we might translate it as this, God rested Adam in the garden. God rested him. He settled him in the garden. This is temple language. It's only, whenever we see it used, it's only used for items that are found in the temple that are placed on the altar, the items that are rested on the altar for the practice of worshiping the Lord. That's the only time this put is used. So what's man's role? This is, this is a home story, ladies. And at home, he's given this task to what? To work and keep the temple, to keep the garden, to keep the sanctuary. It's different. This is a different work from God's work. Um, that work we described as mission, business, craftsmanship. This work, again, it's a term used only for priests who are in the temple and it means to serve, to worship. And we see he's to keep, which means to maintain and to guard the temple. Genesis 1, house story. Genesis 2, home story. Home story. This is where our heart is. This is where God's heart is. This is where he will rest, relate, and rule, have dominion over all that he has created. And man will be rested. Man will be at home with God, relating and sharing in God's dominion, sharing in God's rule. So that this lady, here's, ladies, here's, here's our new definition for rest in the Old Testament. Because maybe we'll see this idea as we go on. Rest could be defined as this. And I know this is a foreign idea to us. Rest is the blessing of worshiping God in the safety of his presence. Rest is the blessing of worshiping God in the safety of his presence. Ladies, oh, you have to let that sink in a little bit. This is way better, way better than a nap. This is way better than a beach chair. This is where we get to lay down all of our burdens to the Lord. This is where we get to lay them all down. And we give him this, and he transforms it. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary. And he transforms it into this. How? He, he says, Jesus said in 738, whoever believes in me, the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Here's, isn't that something? And here's another hidden gem. It's hidden away in Ezekiel. 36, 35, says this. The Ezekiel says this. And they will say, the land that was desolate, the land that was desolate will become like the Garden of Eden. The land that was desolate, <laughs> this, will become like this. 
And God goes on to say, I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. Uh, ladies, how do we apply that? How do we apply that? St. Augustine said this, You, God, have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Our hearts are restless until they find their hearts in you. <laughs> we need to be in the garden with him, and it's easy. It's what Jesus said, believe Believe I am the way and the truth and the life. And God takes us and he puts us into his garden. And he does that here. Ladies, uh, I know most of us here have made that step. And if you're still feeling like this, I think we ask ourselves, like there's a, there's a bajillion ways we can apply this. But here's another thing that I ask myself. What am I worshiping? What am I worshiping? Have I lost my first love? Worship. Because we're <laughs> this is a home story. Home is where our heart is, right? Let's end there. Oh, Lord God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for um, what we... What you reveal, Lord, about who you are. And here, Lord, we have seen you are the God who has made a home for you and for us that we can be together, that we can function together, that, that we can kingdom build together, that we can rule together. Lord, who are we that you would do that, that you would take notice of us? Lord, thank you. God, Thank you for this beautiful picture of what the garden is. Thank you for what you've created. God, I pray that you would help us to take time today, take time to marvel and to worship of how very good it is in the garden. Lord, help these truths to sink in deep into our hearts, Lord, <laughs> that we can uh, that, that we truly can be those living with, the ri with, with, with hearts just overflowing with the rivers of living water. Thank you, God. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for this time. Thank you for each and every woman that is here. Thank you that your spirit hovers over us. May you now, Lord, hover over our conversations as we dig out more treasure from your word. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, ladies, enjoy discussing.